Eric Darling here with Darling Data, and uh, <clears throat> in this video we are going to talk about a couple of the differences between read committed snapshot isolation and snapshot isolation. Um, we're going to leave read committed, the pessimistic isolation level, out of this because uh, we picked on it enough recently, and uh, we can, my, my, feel, my, my feelings on the subject are already fairly well known. So we're going to skip that this time around. Uh, we're also, it's a happy day here uh, for the Darling Data Board of Directors because uh, we are celebrating the final hour and a half of me having this wild abomination that my last haircut grew out into, which has been uh, peripherally annoying to me for about a week now. So uh, about an hour and a half, we will have an appropriate boys regular summer haircut and uh probably probably debut that bad boy in tomorrow's video what will tomorrow's video be i don't know yet but um i need to keep my social media in turn busy producing tiktok content so uh i'm making videos um uh, actually i should probably make a promo video for the not one but Two pre-cons that I'll be co-presenting with Kendra Little at, at Past Summit this year. I'm finally legally allowed to talk about that, so uh, exciting times, huh? Mm. Um, talk about both of those. So we are going to hit Control and E, and we're going to hit Control and E because I have a return, and that stops things right where I want them. So we got a table called Snip Snap. Why is it called Snip Snap? I don't know. I forgot. I created it a week ago. Or something, and uh, forget what what the uh, the impetus was for that. Uh, perhaps it's uh, in in memory of the the discipline crabs from Return to Zork. I don't know. This mine's a little bit blank at the moment. So we've got this table. It's got one single solitary happy little row in it, and uh, it's got some numbers in it. Date. You know, usual stuff that tables have in them. And uh, what we're going to do is, uh, well, these are already enabled, but let's just make double, extra, triple, pretty sure that uh, both read committed snapshot isolation and snaps snapshot isolation are enabled for my database. And uh, what I've done is I've, I've taken the, the privilege of um, pre-copying and pasting these two things into a couple new windows over here. Right, you can see those things there. And uh, what we're going to do is scroll down a little bit, and we're going to run this update. But before we do that, we are going to kick off these two queries. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what each one is doing. Um, it probably does bear some babbling about. So this first query is going to set the transaction isolation level to read committed, which in a database that has read committed snapshot, snapshot isolation enabled means that we are going to use versioned rows. We are going to uh, use read committed snapshot isolation as our isolation level. In this window, uh, we are setting the transaction isolation level to snapshot, right? So we are requesting snapshot isolation for these queries. And in both of them, we're gonna say begin tram, uh, select data from the table, wait 10 seconds, and then select data again, and then commit. So both of these are doing a roughly the same thing, just under slightly, just under the two different optimistic isolation levels in, available in SQL Server. So we're going to hit Control and E here. We're going to hit Control and E here, and then we're going to hit the update here. So the update ran uh, after, for both of these, the begin tran was. Uh, was the transaction started, right? So begin train here, begin train here, then we waited 10 seconds. And you're gonna notice some differences in the results. So under read committed snapshot isolation, this is what we get back. We get back the first result, which shows the pre-update state of the table. And in the second result, we get the post-update state of the table. So uh, this changed, so we have uh, this thing here, which does not match this thing here because this got that 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 got updated, and I also updated the a number column to be one three eight one three eight from one three eight. Okay, so under read committed snapshot isolation, 
you get query results back from the version store whenever a query runs, right? So the begin tran has almost nothing to do with what goes on here. We selected data from the table here. Uh, in the 10 seconds that we waited for, the data changed. And when we did ran the select for a second time, we got the, we got the, ref the reflected results ah, from uh, after the update ran. Under snapshot isolation, that is different. If we look at the results here, we will see that uh, the A number did not change in between. And even though the uh, actual date of this thing running is 10 seconds apart, we'll give or take a few milliseconds there, uh, 43 to 53, that's the important part, the date column that got updated as well also didn't change. These numbers are exactly the same. With snapshot isolation, the query returned results from the table, from the version store, from when the begin trans started. So rather than each select returning slightly different results like they did over here, right? Like this, this one waited 10 seconds and showed what happened after the update ran. SQL Server is holding on to the version store and it's saying whenever this begin trans started, these two selects are going to return the same data. Right, so like if we if the if the table data changes between when this one runs and when this one runs, we're going to use the version store to return the same, uh, we're to return data from the same point when the transaction started. Right, so snapshot isolation did not reflect the update change between the two runs of the query. Read committed snapshot isolation did. This is of course something that you need to consider when choosing an isolation level for your workload. Um, like I've said in half a dozen videos now, including yesterday's video, it's quite rare for any single workload to, or any single isolation level to be 100% perfect for your entire workload, right? Like we talked about read committed the pessimistic isolation level yesterday versus read committed snapshot isolation. And even though in retrospect, I think I should have, I, I could have done the RCSI demo a little bit better because in reality, it would have been more something like if every modification like ran in its own transaction and you saw the changes like with RCSI as they went, but it's good enough for um, good enough for that. Maybe I'll re-record it and, and talk a little bit more about that, but um, maybe, maybe, maybe that'll be, what's today? Oh God, these weeks, these weeks never end. Seems like no rest for the content creator. All right, so uh, that's one, uh, one of the differences that I wanted to talk about between snapshot isolation and read committed snapshot isolation. Uh, when you end up within a transaction, the snapshot isolation queries will return data from when the transaction started, and with read committed snapshot isolation, the queries return results from when the query runs, right? So there's just two kind of different ways of doing things. <clears throat> and depending on how you would want your application to return data, that could be a pretty big consideration. And um, I mean, not necessarily which one to enable, because if, if you need, if you want both to happen, then you need to turn on both. But if you were considering, uh, you know, different sort of read phenomena that might occur under RCSI that wouldn't occur under snapshot isolation, then you would want to ask for snapshot isolation for queries you want to behave it by returning results from when the transaction started rather than when the query runs. So let's reset things over here. And we're going to stick uh, this query into two new windows. So this is going to go into both of them. And uh, let's make sure that committed, and let's paste that in. And then we're going to make sure that this committed, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm a little superstitious about these transactions and stuff. They scare me. Ah, that didn't work. That did not copy and paste. That just hit the letter V. Slightly less useful than anticipated, that keystroke. Uh, what are you going to do? Live TV, right, folks? All right. So uh, what these queries do is, or rather what but the steps that I'm going to take is I'm going to set the transaction isolation level to read committed. I'm going to begin a transaction, and I'm going to run uh, the select and the update. And then I'm going to leave this part till the end. And then over in this window, I'm going to run uh, everything but not commit the transaction. And under read committed snapshot isolation, this is totally fine. Because what happens under read committed snapshot isolation is uh, we start a transaction. 
the select runs and returns data as the table exists currently, and then the update runs. And over here, and we're doing the exact same thing. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna run this. Oh, I actually need to run that too, just in case. Uh, this update gets blocked, right? Because the, the, under RCSI, uh, update queries still block each other, right? Like modification queries still block each other. And this is fine, right? Because we don't want potentially weird stuff happening in our database. So modification queries having to wait and respect blocking is probably good, <laughs> right? And then uh, I want you to notice something though. When I come over here and I hit uh, do run this and we say commit transaction, we get back this. So because our case expression found 138, then it changed it to 666. And then over in this window, uh, our modification query after the blocking was done, found 666 and flipped it to 999, right? So this was the beginning uh, value and this was the end value. And over in this query, this was the result of the table after the update ran. So this is all, I think, you know, kind of perfectly normal transactional stuff, right? Like modification queries get blocked, uh, nothing terrible happens, and everyone has a nice time. Where that changes is with snapshot isolation. So if we quote that out and quote that in, and let's just do that in the other window first too, so I don't have to do too much rearranging when I just wanna run queries, is uh, a little bit different. Uh, so under snapshot isolation, you, run, you can run into something called an update conflict when two queries attempt to modify the same row and one's using the version store and the other one's like, oh, well, I'm using the version store too. Oh, we're gonna fight. <laughs> And what happens is uh, we're going to do the same thing where in this window, we're going, well, this time we're going to change things. We're going to set the transaction isolation level to snapshot. We're going to begin trend. We're going to select, then we're going to run the update. And we get back 999 from here. And over in this window, we're going to run all this stuff. And once we come over here and we say, hey, get committed. This changes to 777, which is what it should have done uh, because this, this hit the else expression of the if branch. But now over in this window, we, the, update doesn't, the update doesn't run. We get all of this gobbledygook back. Uh, let's try to make this a serviceably readable uh, error message with, by the magic of um, the return key and the messages tab. And uh, now we're gonna go and zoom on in. So what we got back over here was this, where SQL Server now said, whoa, 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 two updates? Trying to mess with the same row? You crazy? Must be crazy. So snapshot isolation uh, transaction aborted due to update conflict. You cannot use snapshot isolation to access table snip snap directly or indirectly in database crap to update, delete, or insert the row that has been modified or deleted by another transaction. Retry the transaction or change the isolation level for the update delete statement. That is a hell of an error message. This is back from when people wrote error messages that they cared about or when the people who wrote error messages cared about you as an end user. Nowadays, you get error messages like the transaction done. No further, no further information is <laughs> available at this time. Uh, uh, there's typos, there's inconsistencies, there's grammatical issues. Uh, error messages these days are not what they used to be. Um, it's a genuine, real decline in quality <laughs> of error messages. Uh, so if you're using, again, considering which isolation level you want to use for your workload, Snapshot isolation can seem very attractive when you're getting your little 10, 10 foot feet piggies wet with optimistic isolation levels because you can ask certain queries to opt in and use snapshot isolation and uh, not have to worry about like uh, the ramifications of every query in your query universe using, uh, uh, re uh, using version rows via read committed snapshot isolation. So it can be tempting to do that but there are considerations that you have to make around two of the things that we, the two things that we talked about today. One, uh, do you want the beginning of a transaction to mark where all queries return data from? Two, do you want to deal with 
uh, potential conflicts between modification queries. Now, a lot of people who start uh, you know, getting into optimistic isolation levels, what they'll do is they'll take, they'll use snapshot isolation and they'll use it sparingly on certain read queries that they don't want to get blockaded or cause blocking uh, in the database. Usually like reporting queries, stuff like that. It's not often used in places where like modification queries are happening. However, you might, you know, have a store procedure that does some stuff and you might uh, set the isolation level to snapshot in your store procedure and you might not like, you know, fully realize all of the different things your store procedure is doing. Or maybe if it calls another store procedure that does some stuff, you could end up with these sort of uh, errors that you would never get under uh, read committed or read committed snapshot isolation that you now have to you know, defensively code for or change the isolation level prior to them hitting. And anyway, it's a, it's a lot of additional sort of like, uh, like code, code, code review stuff, right? It's things you have to think about. You know, of course, you don't have to deal with this under RCSI, but under RCSI, you really do have to sort of figure out like, well, what parts of my code might need to get blocked to work correctly. I don't know. Again, it's usually stuff like uh, working off queue tables, uh, any sort of queuing process, um, you know, uh, like if you're the kind of maniac who like has a table sequence table where you're generating sequences rather than using identities or built in sequences, then those are probably places in the code where you wouldn't want optimistic, optimistic isolation levels to happen because you, you know, would get like, you know, duplicate, you could potentially get like duplicate results under concurrency. So not, obviously not ideal that, but this is something to consider when trying to pick an isolation level because there, you know, while snapshot isolation does have more of an opt-in feel to it, where like, you know, with RCSI, you have to like opt queries out when you don't want them to use uh, row versioning to read from. With, under snapshot isolation, you say, well, yeah, we'll just opt right in and then, you know, everything will be fine. But you do have to think about, you know, uh, A, like, like, if you, like how you want the query results affected by transactions and how you want, and if you want to feel like, you know, writing a bunch of defensive code to like retry uh, uh, snapshot isolation conflicts like this. So some more food for thought for you out there. Uh, a lot of t a lot of the time when I see people turn on RCSI, they will also turn on, also turn on snapshot isolation, uh, but never actually ask for it and use it, which, you know, is <laughs> kind of silly, but... Uh, you know, might be might be useful in circumstances where queries uh, may need to use uh, one or the other. Um, I, I have I have run into a number of very funny clients who uh, like had both turned on, and I was like, oh, well, or what do you use both for? You know, asking just like you know, sort of get to know you questions, and they're like, oh, I thought you had, I thought you had to turn on both. I was like, oh no no no, you can you can choose one or the other. You can you can be team RCSI. And you can be team SI. You don't have to be both teams at once. I mean, even though even though I'm a fan of both teams for various reasons, uh, you you don't have to turn on both to have one or the other work. So uh, there there is there is that. So anyway, uh, I guess I guess that's probably about enough. Um, I'm going to go celebrate there being even fewer minutes between now and when I get this. This thing, I don't even know what to call this thing. I don't think that there is a name in the world of hair for this flip that is happening to, on my head at the moment. Uh, it's, it's quite aggravating. So yeah, uh, I'm, gonna go, I'm gonna go do that. Uh, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. I hope you learned something. Uh, if this is the type of SQL Server content that you enjoy, uh, I, I, like, I like comments and I like thumbs ups. And I also like new subscribers. So if, if you've never seen one of these before, you can hit the thumbs up button, leave a comment and subscribe. Uh, if you've already subscribed, you can like it and leave a comment. There's endless possibilities here, right? You take those three things and put them together, there's like 14 quadrillion possible combinations of things, that you, actions you could take based on your current status in my YouTube world. All right, cool, all right. Uh, that's, that's, that's about enough for now. Thank you. Thank you for watching.